Okay. So we'll uh, start off with uh, Second Corinthians. Right. So just like how we uh, looked at the whole background of why it's uh, Second Corinthians happened, sorry, First Corinthians happened, then you know, um, uh, and so on. So we see that Paul writes First Corinthians from Ephesus, and from there he has moved on to minister in the Macedonian region, which is uh, you know cities like Thessalonica and uh, Berea and Philippi and so on. So in this Macedonia Macedonian region is uh, where. Uh, from he writes uh, is from where he writes um, the second epistle to the Corinthians, right? So, so in this Macedonian region, he of course recounts all the sufferings, all the great difficulties that has happened to him, and he writes about that. We see it in chapter eleven. Um, he he writes that, and also um, uh, Titus is the one who has come and given him some good reports about the church in. Corinth. So he meets Titus, Titus, uh, from Titus he receives the news, and also uh, uh, mostly through um, uh, Titus and uh, two epistle, uh, two, sorry, two other um, disciples is uh, through whom he sends the epistle, uh, this letter, uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, back to the Corinth. And also we see that um, uh, in that, that, that whole responsibility of collections being taken to Jerusalem, uh, we see that uh, uh, it it happens through Titus. You know, Titus is given the responsibility, and um, and also we we see there's a continuity of thought, continuity of certain instances which happened, which he's addressing in First Corinthians is also you know uh, referring to those in a second epistle. Right. So, uh, well, historians say that it could have been written around AD 56 or 57, but we're not very sure. Uh, but it's a general approximation, just like how you know AD 53 or 54 um, could be the possibility of uh, uh, the time time period of First Corinthians, uh, just like that, 56, 57 could be uh, the time period when Second Corinthians, the second epistle, was written. Right? Okay. Okay. So let's uh, let's read through from chapter 1 onwards okay chapter 1 um, starts with the greetings so paul an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god and timothy a uh, brother uh, to the church of god, to the church of uh, um, god which is at corinth with all the saints who are all who are in all achaia grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ um, so the, this is uh, his usual greeting, and that's how he that's how he starts uh, the episode, right? And we see several things he's calling, uh, yes, himself is referring to as the apostle of Jesus Christ, the one who sent one, uh, one who sent by the Lord on a particular mission. That is who an, an apostle is. Uh, same same way in which he addresses himself in the first epistle also called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and through the will of God. And he's saying, you know, and also Timothy, our brother. So Timothy is with him uh, to the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints who are all in all Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God. So um, grace and peace, which is ours, the grace of God, which is divine enablement divine empowerment divine character and all that you know be is saying that you know it's 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 yours uh, and and also the peace of god the harmony and uh, um, you know uh, everything that comes with it security safety uh, and it is ours so he's saying you know grace and peace to you from god our father he's the source and uh, it is to you right um verse uh, 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if you are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or 
If you are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. Right? So uh, he's talking about this diving right in into the kind of troubles and also the kind of supernatural uh, consolation that he has been experiencing. And he sees this connection between the suffering and the and the consolation, right? So he's saying, you know, uh, he's referring to the Lord. He's saying he's the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. You know, the the word comfort meaning paraklesis, which means, you know, to come alongside, to draw near, to come alongside, and to bring in that comfort and bring in that consolation, right? So he says uh, he's the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation okay and the word tribulation meaning you know it's like how you if you like put a stack of papers and you press it you know or put something and then you apply weight on it and press it you know that's the that's the word so this tribulation refers to uh, uh, you know pressure and oppression and that they might be experiencing it says who comforts us in all our tribulation right so that's a very um, the, the, that's a very positive and that's a very comforting thought. You know, it says, God of mercies, fa Father of mercies and God of all comfort, He comforts us in all our tribulations. So whatever it is, He comforts us. And this is this. The intention is this. He comforts us so that we can pass on the comfort. Right? He comforts us so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with what? With the same comfort that we received, that we received from God, the same kind of thing, ministry that we received from God, we are able to pass on and minister to others also. Right. So, so he's saying personally, he has actually experienced this comfort, and therefore he is able to comfort others also. Right. So, so you know, so it's a good thing that in the sense that just because we go through these sufferings, we go through these tribulations. It says that we are comforted in each one of them. Right? We are comforted because one of the things that we see is that the Holy Spirit he is the comforter, that he's the helper. So he's the paracleta. So true to his word, he helps, he comforts, he consoles. And right? so he says that in all of the tribulations that we that whatever i had faced and he's you know in, we read about it in romans chapter 8 he right reads about some of those you know the, uh, it lists down some of those things that he difficulties that he went through also in this in this episode also in chapter 11 we he he writes about the kind of things that he went through uh, being whipped and imprisoned persecution and also physical discomfort in terms of being shipwrecked and and so on and uh, and so he writes about that. Um, he's saying in all that, we have actually been comforted. We have actually been, which is a, which is a you know which is a which is an amazing thing for a person who could be in ministry or just going through life, saying that you know this God, whom I have trusted in, you know he 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 knows me, he sees me, he's aware of all that I'm going through, and I can receive consolation and comfort from him now this is very tangible right especially um you know if someone is going through bereavement and you know we are at a loss of words how can i console this person how can i bring comfort to this person but we can be assured that the comfort and consolation that god brings will definitely you know make a mark in their lives of course we need to be able to receive you know we can't shut close be closed to whatever God is bringing and saying, we need to you know, operate in faith and we need to be submissive and be able to receive that. But the fact is that this difficulty, this challenge, this tribulation or trial is an opportunity to receive from God. Right? Whenever we go through, you know, uh, and it's a great mindset to have, perspective to have, saying that, hey, I'm going through some difficult times, but it is also a time so I can receive. Now, it is exactly the time, exactly the opportunity, so I can receive from God, receive consolation for this very thing, receive comfort for this very thing, and strength for this thing that I'm going through. Right. So he says, verse five: For as the sufferings of Christ 
abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ Jesus. Right? Sufferings uh, of Christ, meaning the for the sake of the gospel, you know, for the sake of ministry, whatever sufferings that they went through, right? sufferings of Christ abound in us. You know, it's saying it's it's just abounding. It's just more, more and more every day in terms of persecution, in terms of you know the opposition that I'm facing and physical discomfort and you know uh, lack and all that, a lack of sleep and hunger and all that. He says that because of the travel, because of being in prison, saying in all that, as the sufferings abound, the consolation also abounds through Christ. You know? So verse 6 says, if, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Uh, and our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. So, um, so he's saying, you know, if you are afflicted, if you are going through the sufferings, you know, it is for your consolation and salvation. Why? Because, you know, we are getting persecuted and we are going through this hardship for your sake, right? For the sake of the gospel, for the sake of, you know, the the, the whom to persons to whom we are ministering. So, it is for your sake. If you are comforted, then again, you know, it is for your consolation and salvation. So this com consolation and salvation is something, this is a common denominator, whether we get persecuted or whether we are consoled, you know, you will, you receive that. It is for your sake, right? And our hope for you is steadfast, he says, because we know that since you are also partakers or people who take, who are fellowship or in partnership with the sufferings, we know that you will also be in fellowship and partnership for the uh, consolation also, right? So that is the reality, and that is the supernatural work of God. So he's saying that, you know, uh, if, if you are steadfast, I mean, our hope for you is steadfast, knowing that if you are partakers, and then the word uh, they're coming from, uh, from the word koinonia, right? So if you are a partaker, and um, if which means you are you know this close fellowship of suffering, then you are also in the close fellowship of the consolation, right? So, so that's really something to praise God, something that is tangible, uh, that is coming to the uh, to the ones who are persecuted, and and time and again you hear of that, right? You hear of that from people who testify. Um, who are going through great persecution, but then they're saying that, yes, yes, we are going through this, but we are also being comforted. Yes, we are also being strengthened. The first time I heard, you know, in a, in a short-term Bible college and uh, just talking to this person who's, who had become a believer and, um, and because of, you know, uh, his caste, they would not allow him to go water from that well in the village. You know, they said, you know, you now you now that you've accepted Christ, you have now fallen to a lower caste, and this is only for the upper caste. This well, so he and his wife and children, they had to actually, you know, go to uh, travel a long distance for something basic as water, like water to drink, water for everything. You know, they didn't have running water through taps, but they had to, they had to depend on the well. But because that avenue was shut they had to grow go there and then he was, he was talking about other you know forms of persecution violence and all the ex, 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 they experienced you know but at the end of it he said that you know but you know our god is good and we will never go back we will never you know let go of jesus because we have experienced jesus the love of god this the comfort of god that we have experienced and so we will never let go so i was really you know, challenged. I was really that day very inspired um, uh, and challenged to hear that right, the kind of suffering that he was going through for the sake of Christ, but at the same time the kind of comfort and consolation that he was experiencing through Christ uh, in the midst of those sufferings. Something so tangible. So uh, you know, whatever be the nature of suffering, uh, we can always be sure that there is this consolation which is coming through Christ and uh, which is something so tangible, something so strong that strengthens us as believers, right? And it's an opportunity um, uh, uh, for 
receiving the comfort. It's an opportunity. We can say, yes, Lord, now I open my heart. You know, now I know that you know it is available for me and I receive it. Right? Okay. Uh, verse 8 onwards. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also, helping together in prayer for us, that many thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf, for the gift granted to us through many. So he's saying, you know, we don't want you to be ignorant of the troubles that happened to us in the in the region, in the Asian region. And, uh, and he says, you know, we and you know, he mentions this in various epistles, like uh, in the book of Acts, we read through it. In uh, First Corinthians, he talks about Ephesus, and he says, says that he had to, you know, battle wild beasts. Um, then in Second Corinthians eleven, he talks about the kind of uh, physical um, physical punishment that he received, and so on. So, um, so we see that you know all these things. Um, he's saying you know I don't want you to be ignorant. It doesn't hold back all the difficulties that he went went through. So he's saying you know this is hey this is the reality of ministry. This is the reality of Christian life. So I don't we don't want you to be ignorant. Like, you know, if you recall, another place where he says, um, "We don't want you to, you to be, we don't want you to be ignorant, brother." Do you, do you recall? Do you remember where he uses that same phrase? I don't want you to be ignorant. Um, in the earlier epistle, anyone uses the same phrase? You know, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. You remember? Okay, if you uh, no, if you look at uh, one Corinthians twelve, right, where he's talking about the, he's, he's just going to talk to them about the gifts, right? He uses the same phrase, right? I don't want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. I do not want you to be. Ignorant, which means you can't be in a place of ignorance, not knowing this, uh, not what. Knowing this meaning, not uh, knowing this truth, not walking in this truth. So here also he uses the same thing. You know, I do not want you to be. We don't want you to be ignorant. You should know this. You should know that. You know, this is possible. All this is possible. It can happen to the believer. And so I don't want you to be ignorant of it. Right. So he's saying we burdened beyond measure, above strength, and we despaired of life itself. Right. Verse nine says we have the death sentence in ourselves, or the sentence of death. Um, sentence of death is, you know, it's a legal term, it's a legal verdict which is given in a court of law, saying that the capital punishment, saying that, you know, all the arguments and all the decisions and all the discussions, deliberations are over, and this is the final, you know, final verdict. There's nothing beyond that, right? Um, unless it's a judicial pardon or something. So saying this was the end, you know, this is, the, it was so overwhelming that. There was no hope. We carried that sentence of death in ourselves. Now, we cannot trust in ourselves. We cannot trust in our ability. We cannot trust in you know any other person. But we can. But we can definitely trust in God, who raises the dead. You know, this sentence of death. It's like a final thing, just like death itself. Right? Death is final. There seems to be no hope. Right? There's. That's it. The end. But he's saying, you know, we don't we don't want to trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raises the dead. You know, even when we say that okay, things have come to an end, things have come to a close, there's no possibility after this. It's a dead end, right? It's as final as death itself, the situation, this whole thing. It says that, but we trust in God who raises the dead. And and he says in verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death and thus deliver us so which means he delivered us then he continues to deliver us and uh, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us so past present and future right it says that well 
this is what God did in the past. He did deliver us. He's, he's continuing to do it. And he will deliver us in the future also. So he's talking about the unchanging nature of God, uh, the promises of God, the character of God, the power of God. But also he's talking about the fact that you no, know, this was the kind of situations from which he, the extent to which he delivered us and continues to deliver us. And verse 11, you, you've been praying. You know, you've been interceding, you've been praying, you've been helping, and uh, you know, and let there be many thanks for by many persons for our behalf, uh, and this gra gift granted to the release of this gift, uh, gift. Sorry, uh, and he's using the word charis there, this free gift of grace, the effective ministry that has happened uh, in answer to many prayers. Right, so saying, you know, you've been helping, you've been praying, you've been interceding, and God has delivered us and continues to deliver us and he we know that we have faith that he will deliver us also so the importance of prayer in the importance of um ministry prayer mi praying for ministry for those in ministry and so on right so uh, we also see that uh, the effectiveness in ministry is is through christ through his power through his grace right okay verse 12 um for our boasting is this, right? For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, So here he's saying that, you know, this is our boasting. You know, this is our uh, boasting in the Lord, that the testimony of our conscience, this is our boasting in the Lord. We can actually go before God. We can be confident. We can boast. That what have we? What can we boast of? That our conscience is clear, and that we conducted ourselves. You know, our behavior, the way we ministered, the way we lived among you, or among the in the world, we conducted ourselves in simplicity and sincerity, a like godly sincerity, in simplicity and godly sincerity. You know, in the chapters we see. Um, again and again, that he is going back to how they, the, they ministered among them, how they lived among them, because there was a threat of others who were not doing so, right? Who were trying to take from the church, take from the believers, uh, and not really help them, or not really, you know, build them up uh, in in Christ, right? So they were. They were like he refers to them as wolves and sheep's clothing and so on, right? So here, you know, he says this is our boasting that uh, we conducted ourselves in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, okay, but by the grace of God, uh, and more abundantly towards you, okay. So uh, earlier also, you know, in First Corinthians, we see that Paul is um, saying, you know, I came to you in uh, fear and trembling trembling sorry and uh, and also um, that your faith should not be in you know man's wisdom right i determined to uh, not to know anything among you except jesus christ and him crucified and says you know uh, so my speech preaching it's not with words of human wisdom that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man but in the power of god Right. So here also saying, you know, that it is not with fleshly wisdom. The way we ministered is not with empty philosophy or fleshly wisdom of any sort, but by the grace of God. The grace of God, you know, character, gifting. Um, it also talks about um, unmerited favor, favor of God, and also the enablement, the power of God. So he's saying, the ministry happened by the grace of God, uh, and it happened through the power of God. When we say grace, we are also talking about the power of God, right? Enablement, divine empowerment of God. So the power of God, it could talk about the supernatural, it could talk about the you know the change in character, transformation, everything, right? So this is how we ministered 
uh, to you and we were this is how we lived uh, among you among in the world right and uh, yeah so um, so he says that you know we are not writing any other things 13 than what you will read or understand there's no hidden agenda there's nothing you know it's, it's plain we are open and we are saying it openly we are writing to you i'm writing to you openly and there's nothing else whatever you see read understand that is what it is right there's nothing else that uh, i have um, hidden or anything so um, yes you are understood us in part and a boast is that you are also ours he talks about you know you are ours uh, uh, in the day of Lord Jesus Christ, and he's writing, um, and he's and he also writes to them about, um, um, you know, that isn't that you are our epistle. You know, we read that uh, a little later, that you are our epistle, you are, and people can see you and so on. Right? Uh, when they see you, they read our work, uh, etc. Right? Okay, let's read from verse fifteen onwards. And this, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before, that you might have a second benefit, to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on your my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly, or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by, by, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul and to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Okay, so um, here, uh, you know, we, we see in this uh, letter, his Paul is really, you know, just sharing his heart, right, in his interaction with the people, the way he lived and the way they lived and moved, and is is really interactive. So we see a little more depth, a little more, you know, emotions and all that Paul is sharing in this episode, right? And so he says, uh, you know, this is a confidence, you know, in this confidence, I intended to come to you. So he's saying, he's talking about now he is writing this from Macedonia. So he's saying that you know I actually wanted to come um, by you know I wanted to come to Macedonia on the way to sorry I, I went to come I wanted to come to Corinth on the way to Macedonia and also you know come back uh, to Macedonia on my way to Judea and I I wanted to do that but uh, I I changed you know I changed my mind and uh, and. Uh, he, he says, you know, I uh, in in Corinth, right? I, so sorry, in the first episode also, he, he talks about that. When I come to you, I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. I'm just reading, you know, from verses five, that it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey. For I do not wish to. This is the last few, uh, you know, the last chapter that we just read. I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. Like when he's planning his thing, saying if the Lord permits, you know, I. But Paul changed his mind uh, and uh, visited them on the way to Macedonia itself, right? And uh, and we see that this visit was a very difficult one. We see it in the as we read further. We see so he visited Corinth. And it was a difficult one because um, he had to address some very difficult things with them, right? About certain people, and we read it in the second chapter. We read it also in chapter, um, yeah, uh, in, in second chapter. There's a lot that he says, and also in chapter seven. Right? So this visit uh, was actually did not seem to be 
beneficial for them because he had to uh, a lot of these a lot of these difficult things were there and so on the way back he he actually um you know he avoids that visit he said you know he wanted to actually visit them twice on the way to uh, macedonia and also you know on the way back on the way to judea um, he also wanted to visit them but then he he skips that visit you know he changes his mind he does not visit them um but he also says that his ministry visits his plans you know, is not done lightly okay um, that is something that we see in verse 17 when i was planning did i do it lightly or the things that i plan uh, so he's talking about the ministry visits and also about anything else that he plans uh, things that i plan do i plan according to the flesh uh, but it's he says no it is not according to the flesh that i plan um, and for he says that uh, as god is faithful our word to you was not yes and no and it it is yes right so it means that doesn't vacillate between or you know yes and no and maybe and so on but he says you know our word to you was yes so as sure as the promises of god in christ are yes and in him amen to the glory of god right so he says as sure as that is in christ whatever we have promised and to the believer you know so we know that is yes uh, and it's not yes and no as sure as things in god are yes so so in consultation with god in, uh, uh, in as being led by the spirit of god is what i plan these things is what he says right so and verse 20 all the promises of god in him or that is in christ are yes and in him are men to the glory of god through us so we are made in the image of god we have the life and nature of god in us so as we see the promises of god a yes and amen in christ jesus so also it it is with us is what you know is, is what he's testifying about himself and so for us also you know it can be the same thing the promises of god as the nature of god is not just yes and you know, today and tomorrow it is not maybe and the day after it is no you know it's not like that the promises of god in christ are yes and it's an amen you know saying you know yeah we agree to it it is so right so so also it is uh, with us right so we look at some of these in christ promises we know you know is that uh, we are one spirit with him and uh, 1 corinthians 1 30 says that he became you know we are the righteousness of god as he became for us in christ you know we have received the sanctification redemption um romans 8 1 therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in christ jesus so these are some in christ um in christ changes that have happened in christ promises that we have received right so he's saying you know all those promises in christ are yes and in him amen well, it's sure right so he's comparing that the nature of god is saying that because it is yes and amen right um is it is yes so also our nature and then it also says that the promises of god are yes and amen in christ jesus right verse 21 22 now he who establishes us with you in christ and has anointed us is god right who has seated us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee so um it's a, a you know very reassuring verse again saying that we are established in christ we are made firm and sure in christ jesus and we are established how we are rooted uh, in christ jesus and and in fact um he says us, establishing us along with you establishing all of us right uh, in christ jesus and who anoints us right? anointing the presence of god the power of god is is god so he has done it right? and also he used verse 22 he says he has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts he has sealed us he has, we have, he has marked us he has made a mark on us as as his purchased possession you know he he uses that uh, uh in I think in uh, in the first epistle also right 
yeah, he has uh, enriched us and, and so on. Um, uh, I'm sorry, it, it, he says this in, um, I think it's in, in one of the other epistles. Um, is an he says it's an efficiency also, you know, to the efficient church. He says uh, uh, we are you were sealed, efficient uh, efficient chapter one and verse thirteen. He says in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and verse fourteen in Ephesians one, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of His glory. Right. So, so he's saying you know we are sealed. We are. We have made a mark. It means uh, a mark that identifies a mark that that is like a divine protection, a mark that um, uh, that says that yeah, this is authentic. You know, this is real. So it's like um, that mark is on us by the Holy Spirit, that He has actually put a mark on us. Uh, because of his presence, like because of his indwelling presence, that we are under his protection, that we belong to him, that etc. Right? Then he also goes on to say, and he has given us the spirit in our hearts. Now that we are marked by the Holy Spirit, he sealed us, but we have also been given the Holy Spirit in our hearts. He indwells us as a guarantee, right? As a pledge, as a guarantee, as a down payment or a deposit. Now, what is the guarantee? What is the down payment for? For the redemption that will be made you know, as a as in a in a full manner uh, at his coming, right? Where we receive glorified bodies, where our bodies are also redeemed, um, and and so on. The where the redemption is complete, right? So um, we see this in uh, Ephesians one, that right? was a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So he's a guarantee. Same word which is used there in the Greek, it means arabon, which means a deposit or a down payment that is made. So we make the down payment and deposit, and knowing that okay, this belongs to us, or this is ours. But the payment will be made full, and at the fullness of it, you know, there is there are certain things that happen also that that redemption is complete. That, that is when you say that, yeah, it is complete. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts is the down payment, right? is the uh, deposit, is the guarantee that there will be a full redemption, right? So, um, so now that is something that we can rejoice in. Yes, the Holy Spirit has sealed us. The Holy Spirit, you know, we have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit is there, and God has done that, and He has also sealed us, made a mark. We are His purchased possession. And the presence, indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is our guarantee, right? So, which is absolute, you know, absolutely great news for each one of us as believers. And then verse 23, there's moreover, I called God as witness against my soul that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. Okay, so, um, so he's talking about that difficult visit. Some hard words were spoken to them. They were addressed. Things were addressed in a, in a quite a hard, harsh manner. But he also says that you know, I we don't have dominion over your faith. You don't have dominion over your. We can't manipulate your faith. We cannot. We don't. We don't. We can't have. We can't be. We can't be bosses over your life, over your faith in God, right? Where we say, you know, we can't dictate things to you, but we are fellow workers, you know. So that's another thing that we see that we can learn in the way Paul, who was moving with all the apostolic authority, right, uh, establishing churches and doctrine and and instructions and so on, with all the apostolic author authority. But he says, you know, this is who we are. We are fellow workers for your joy. We are co-workers for your joy. For by faith is what you stand. Right? So we don't have dominion. We don't. We are not bossing over your faith. And he also, you know, is is kind of sensitive to their emotional state and what they have gone through because of his visit and the things that he spoke to them. So he said that no, I to spare you, I came no more. I don't want to add to your, you know, sorrow or you know the 
weight of the emotions that you were feeling. So I didn't want to add to that. So I just, you know, we I skipped that. I did not visit on the way back to uh, Judea, right? So he says, um, okay, so that's that brings us to the end of um, um, chapter one. Okay, so any any questions, any thoughts here before we move move on? Yeah, yes, uh, Nina. Uh, the comfort that is being talked about in this first chapter, uh, Pastor, yeah. Yeah. it is uh, looking at the verses, it's talking about when you go through something yeah. uh, for the sake of Christ. I mean, we may be going through different things, no? I mean, like I'm saying, in the course of life, mm. there may be uh, a sickness or there may be. Uh, surgeries that yeah. we have to go through or different different things in the course of life but here yeah. let's talk the comfort that uh, paul is talking about is it is it i mean only related only to that because he it's mentioned there you know in christ mm. our comfort overflow so if we yeah. go through something for the sake of christ right that is so, when yeah. we receive so, comfort from god is it only that yeah. is what i just yeah. yeah so so here of course he's specifically talking about uh, the nature of suffering and he's focusing on the suffering that happens because of uh, being in ministry by virtue of being in ministry and you know all the hardships and uh, all that uh, as a as a you know as a natural course of action because of that right because i'm in ministry because i'm going through this there is opposition and so he's specifically talking about that however we know that god is the god of hope and comfort so no matter what the nature of suffering or the cause of suffering, right? Suffering happens because of various reasons. We know that, you know, it's, it could be because of our own choice. It could be because of others' choices, because of the enemy, and just because of the fact that it's a fallen world. You know, it's, the whole nature is under the bondage of corruption. So it could happen for various reasons. But well, the consolation of God, primarily for this, but then also. You know, reaches to reaches us because he is the Paracletos. He's the Paraclete, right? One who comes alongside to comfort us. One one who comes alongside to console us. Right? So, um, yes, his comfort, his uh, we can say for sure, with surety, his comfort and you know, consolation reaches us in all those other situations also, which we might be. You know, sometimes we we might have walked into it. We might be ignorant of in our ignorance whatever or willfully also but it's it reaches us you know why how can we say for sure because of the cross and because of the finished work of the cross which uh, where the great transaction took place where the great exchange took place so we can you know we can be sure it's, it's a, the willingness of god to comfort us and the power and the ability of god to comfort us both are you know very present and real Yeah. Okay. Yes. Any you. other? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So, if you see the sequence of events, Paul from Corinth has gone to Ephesus. He receives the letter. He writes the first epistle. From Ephesus, from Ephesus, he he goes to the Macedonian region. So. In closing the first episode, he says, you know, I'm going to Macedonia and and I want to visit both on the way and also from there um, to Judea. I want to visit Corinth. So he mentions that. However, when he goes there and he we see that there are some things which are not in order, some things which are still, you know, uh, people have not really, you know, taken in and, and all that. So he has some some disciplinary things and some harsh words uh, have been spoken and uh, some hard words. You know. So uh, from there, he moves on to uh, the Macedonian region. And from there, he writes the second uh, epistle. So that's the, you know, in the timeline, that is how we see the sequence. Uh, and also the fact that he does not visit them, as he had mentioned, on the way back to Judea, right? So, yeah, 
so that is how it is. Um, let's look at uh, chapter two then, if there are no questions. Okay, so we just start off with chapter two and then we can continue in the next class, right? Okay, but I determined this within myself. Okay, so he's talking about, hey, I made you sorrowful in my first visit. So I, you know, and, and, sorry, in the visit uh, on the way to Macedonia, I've, you know, made you sorrowful. Okay, so he says, but I determined this within myself that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad, but the one who's made sorrowful by me? And I write this very thing to you, lest when I come, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you that all uh, in you, in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you should know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Okay, so so he's um, so he reiterates why he did not visit them and the reason for writing to them. And so saying that uh, this was this was a visit that did not, you know, it, there was a lot of sorrow. And so he's saying, you know, I had to do it, right? So we, I did it. But who will make me joyful when, you know, how can those who are sorrowful make me joy, joyful when I am in sorrow, etc. So, so he says that I, you know, I, I wrote this so that I should. Uh, have sorrow, I should, lest when I come, when I come again and visit, uh, lest I should have sorrow. So I, I just want to write, right? Um, and says that out of much affliction and anguish, he wrote. Okay, so, so which means that after writing uh, and things that he's writing also is with a lot of anguish of heart, which means a lot of grief, a lot of uh, sorrow that he's writing. And he says with many tears that not that you should be grieved, that you should know the love which I have so abundantly for you. So in, intention of writing uh, uh, this hard letter was so that they should know the love. So which means that you know he he he's, he had his real you know his heart for was for the church, uh, for the believers, and he was concerned about how they felt and etc. And his motivation was love. Okay, but the, but also we real, realize that correction, discipline is also part of um, you know the household of faith, a part of the church. And but we do it in a dignified manner. We do it uh, the motivation being love. We do it so that um, there is no damage to oneself and to the body of Christ. Right. So um, we know that. Disciplining is definitely not um, uh, not a very pleasant task, right? but it 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 needs to be done in the right way, of course. Right. So he, he says, you know, I wrote to you with many tears, uh, uh, the affliction. Not that you should be grieved, but that you should know the love that I have abundantly for you. Right. Okay. So um, yeah, we'll stop here. And then we'll continue from verse five onwards in our next class, right? Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, God bless. We'll meet again.